Welcome to Storyline Church. We count it an honor that you would allow us to have a voice in your story. We're here to help you know God, find community, discover purpose, and make a difference. We hope you enjoy this message from our lead pastor. Hey, welcome to Church Online. I'm so excited that you're here. Uh, today we're kicking off a brand new uh, series. So if this is your first time, welcome home. And if this is home, welcome back. Uh, my name is Akeem. I'm the lead pastor of Storyline Church. And we launched a Storyline just over a year ago. And we're excited uh, to share this uh, new uh, Christmas series uh, message with you this morning. And uh, we're going to begin in 2 Samuel chapter 9. Okay, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 9. If this is your first time, it's going to be on the screen screen. Uh, If it's not, hey, you can follow along with an app or whatever uh, you use to uh, access the Bible. And so 2 Samuel chapter 9, Proverbs says that uh, anxiety in the heart of man weighs him down, but a good word cheers him up. And I'm believing that the word this morning is going to be life-giving for you and that whatever you came with, whatever you brought, that you would leave encouraged and refreshed. Again, we're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 9. Let me just kind of set the table, kind of where we're going. Okay, uh, the table uh, speaks of what the family should be. Uh, the table is the heart of the home, right? Uh, it's where you gather. It's where you break bread. It's where you do brunch. It's where you have breakfast. It's where you do fellowship, right? On average, in our culture, there was a time where people would gather at the dinner table for uh, 90 minutes on average. Uh, today, it's about 12 to 13 minutes, okay? And even in many households, the TV is on. Okay, this isn't like an Amish trip, okay? I'm not trying to get you to uh, put on your uh, aluminum foil hat and throw away your television. Look, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, right? Uh, I think we're losing something when we minimize uh, the precious moments of gathering together at a dinner table. Uh, We lose something. Um, uh, Jamie and I, in our household, we've been getting this kick of just lighting low-lit candles and uh, less screen time. And just the other day, this past week, we were on the couch just hanging out together. And uh, uh, we're talking, and all of a sudden, she pulls up her phone, and there's an app, and she kind of lowers and dims the light in the room. And I'm like, uh, I'm married to a vampire. Okay, <laughs> pray for me, y'all. And so uh, we're just gonna try to be more in- deliberate, intentional about just lower lighting and spending time together, less screens, and uh, uh, and that's just you know what we've been uh, accustomed to doing in our culture. It, it, not only do we spend fewer and lesser times at the dinner table, but it's actually happening later and later in the day. Right? Come on, somebody, you can relate to that. Um, I say there's a whole bunch of positive things that happen, um, you know, as a product of just spending more time at the dinner table. Um, Kids get better grades in school. Uh, There's lower rates of obesity. There's just a bunch of different things that happen that really um, add value to spending more time at the table. So we could agree the table speaks of what the family should be, the heart of the home. And Christmas is all about family. The Christmas story is all about family family. It's Christmas is God inviting you and inviting me into the family. It's God doing everything necessary for us to have a seat pulled up at his table, right? And this is what we lost in the garden, right? We who used to walk with God in the cool of the day, that which was lost seeks to return through the Christmas story so we can once again have a seat at the table. So 2 Samuel chapter 9, I ask you to turn there. Let me set the cast of characters so we kind of have an idea of who we're dealing with. There's about four different characters in our story. Saul, David, and Jonathan is the first three. And uh, Saul is the king of Israel. And like any other king, he intends for his son and his son's sons and his son's sons to uh, become a part of Uh, uh, the dynasty. And that's what would have happened. And what could have happened is Saul did not forfeit the right to become king. And instead, God came to Saul and said, Saul, uh, there's someone better than you and the kingdom's going to be torn from your hands and given to this man who really he was a kid, right? Who did God intend? This young, young boy who was taking care of sheep. And in fact, his father was not, this is awesome, his his father, David's father, did not even have the audacity to invite him to the table when the prophet came into town to anoint and to pick the new king. But God is not like man. 
See, God doesn't see how man sees. You see, man looks on the outward, but God looks on the heart. And I came to tell you this morning that if maybe you've been looked over, passed over, ignored by the people of this world, that God sees you. You're valuable. He has a plan for you. Come on, ask David, this young, or, or, or a young kid, young boy who really had not been going for him at the time, but God saw something in David. He saw something valuable. And so God anointed him to be the next king. And God began to bless David. And he saw that he was capable. And as he became more capable, Saul became jealous of him and began to uh, uh, scheme and to, and, and to try to divide and to uh, get rid of David. But you can't keep a good man down. Come on, you can't keep God's uh, man down. And, and as a light of that, uh, uh, David's life became more difficult, but then eventually became best friends with Saul's son, Jonathan. This is awkward, right? As just Jonathan saw that David had an anointing, had a favor, had God's call on his life to be the next king. And he affirmed that in David. But Saul just kept pushing, kept pushing, and kept pushing to Saul for Jonathan to be king. Can we just t time out really quick, parents? Look, I don't have any kids. Um, uh, I'm not a parent, but I once was a kid, and it's an absolute train wreck trying to push your dreams on your kids' dreams, right? Trying to insist that they go to your alma mater because you went there. Try to insist that they take a, 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 of these advantages because you didn't get those advantages. It's a train wreck. Just the, let me encourage you. The only thing you should encourage your kids to do is to pursue God's dreams, right? The only footsteps they should be walking into, come on, it's Jesus's footsteps. Come on, can I get an amen? in the chat and so here is Jonathan and David and their friendship survives through all this and as their friendship survives uh, Jonathan and David are sitting in the field and it's a very emotional moment Jonathan looks at David and says to him just promise me one thing I know my dad's crazy it's he, he's, he's a madman but promise me one thing that you'll always show kindness to my house that you'll always show kindness to my family David would you promise me that I think he was sensing that this was the last time that they would eventually see each other again. And so David made a covenant and a promise with Jonathan. And so they do. And uh, David is now ran out of Israel by Saul, being chased after as a fugitive. And David is uh, hiding and living and sleeping in caves for over a decade, somebody. For over a decade. By the way, um, in that decade, in those caves... David also wrote majority of the Psalms. You see, some of the most precious things can come out of the darkest moments in our lives, right? Come on, 2020, 2020 has been a year for the books. Come on, it, it can write its own book. And I'm telling you, some of the most precious things can come out of the most darkest moments of your life. And so David uh, uh, um, is on the run and eventually Jonathan and Saul uh, is caught in war and they eventually die in battle. And David hears of it and comes back home and now becomes king that God had intended him to be. And this is kind of where we come to speed and pick it up for our text here in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. Here it is. David asks, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? We're going to read the whole text and come back and highlight some things that will be done. Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, Is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, He is at the house of Machir, son of Amiel, in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Machir, son of Amiel. And then when, here's our fourth character, Meph Phibosheth, son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David. He bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given him your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. 
and Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. I want us to say those last uh, uh, five words together in verse 10. Always eat at my table. Come on, one more time. Always eat at my table. Verse 11, then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord of the king commands your servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son named Amika, and all the members of his household were servants to Mephibosheth. And he, Mephibosheth, lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. I know what you're thinking. Pastor Kim, this is not a Christmas series message. Come on, what is this? Come on, Second Samuel, there's no shepherds. Where are the shepherds, right? Where's the wise men? <laughs> but I promise you, it's, it's this Christmas. It's not Hallmark card Christmas, okay? Um, you're not going to get three points in a poem, and it's not going to be a lot of rum pum pum right? But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, this text doesn't taste like eggnog at first blush, but this is as Christmas as it gets. It's Christmas through and through. Just... Watch with me, okay? Now, here we are in verse 1. David asks, Is there anyone still left of the household of Saul that I could bless and show kindness for Jonathan's sake? You see, now that Saul was dead and David had become crowned king, it was custom in that day to exterminate and to even, if the king was merciful, to banish uh, uh, the members from the kingdom to the to prevent any descendants from pursuing the throne once again. So, right, you familiar with this? Let's get rid of the house of the Targaryens, right? Let's get rid of the house of the Starks, right? Because if there was, a, as long as there was a spark of life from that family that still smoldered, it would potentially be a threat to the new king. But yet David's response was so contrary because of a promise that he made to Jonathan. In fact, there was one still alive that belonged to the house of Saul, right? His name was Mephibosheth, son of David's best friend, Jonathan, son of Saul. And I want to share with you three reasons why you and I are Mephibosheths too. That you and I, we are just like Mephibosheth. Number one, if you're taking notes here, it is life hadn't always gone according to plan. Life hadn't always gone according to plan. Mephibosheth, when he was only five years old, he was being cared for from a servant in his household. And when his father, Jonathan, and his grandfather, uh, Saul, was off to battle, news had came back to the kingdom and to that household and to that servant that the young boy's father and grandson, uh, the young boy's father and, uh, uh, and, and granddad is dead. All of a sudden, this young boy who uh, was accustomed to this lifestyle, his family has now men that he loved. His mother was nowhere in the picture that we know of, and so they had just died. And this news has just been delivered to them. And could you imagine what he is going through with the emotions that he is feeling, having to hear that news and having no one to care for him in their stead? I mean, he's going through it, right? Life is not going, going according to his plan. And in fact... He's about to be stripped from the kingdom. He's about to be brought from the kingdom and everything that he was accustomed to, he no longer would belong to him, right? He's no longer will, will live in a, a throne and be accustomed to this lifestyle. And the servant that was supposed to care for him, that was in his watch, she had, when she heard the news, of course, she thought her job is gone. She's going to lose her job. And so when she was running and getting, trying to get away from the kingdom, her son, I mean, uh, uh, Mephibosheth, fell out of her hands under her watch, and either he broke his back or broke his legs, but he was paralyzed and crippled at five years old. And now he's being ripped from the kingdom. His parents are gone. He's now crippled. He has no one to care for him. And I'm telling you, life is not going according to his plan. If he would have wrote it, it wouldn't have been the way it played out. Uh, Mike Tyson says, you can make a plan 
then you could just get punched in the mouth, right? Come on, that's what 2020 has been like, right? It's nice when you could throw a casual, a Tyson a quote inside of a Christmas message, right? Uh, life has not gone according to plan and we can make plans, but God ordains our steps. And so here is this young boy who's been stripped away from everything. And then secondly, the reason why you and I are like Mephibosheth is number two, his condition became his identity. Ziba answered the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. I wonder, when was the last time Mephibosheth heard his name and not have to be reminded of a mistake, not have to be reminded of an accident, not have to be reminded of his past, of his condition, right? When was the last time he heard that, man, you're a son of a prince, right? You're the grandson of a king, but instead, every time he was greeted or introduced, right? Every time he was greeted, his identity, his value was attached to his condition. So King David asked, where is he? And Ziba answered, he's at the house of Makir, son of Emil, in Lodabar. Translation, here it is. Lodabar is the slums, right? It's, it's worse than what you think. It's the slums. It's, as Lodabar means a, a place of no pasture. There is no food there, right? Uh, uh, and this was a place where this young man has just been stripped from, and he's living now in this remote place, barren, the corner of the kingdom, and, and, and he's unnoticed, unwanted, and under-resourced. Uh, a woman once said this, I forget her name, but she said, the problem with a single story to sh is to show a people as one thing, as only one thing, over and over and over again, and that is what they will become. And I'm afraid that's what happened to Mephibosheth. The story that has been told and played in his head, Mephibosheth the lame, Mephibosheth the maim, Mephibosheth the impede, the cripple, right? The disabled, Mephibosheth worthless and he's been told that story and he's been playing it over and over again and I'm afraid that's what he himself have become but let's be honest did he have a condition of course he did right of course, Mephibosheth had a condition, just like all of us. We all have a condition, a condition of sin, right? We're all sinners. And there's one thing I know about all sinners is that they all die, right? Merry Christmas, okay? Uh, we all die. Why? Because the scripture says, uh, for the wages of sin is death. So like Mephibosheth, we all have a condition, but our condition does not have to watch this determine and define us. So I imagine Mephibosheth living in obscurity and poverty and the remote and barren parts of the corner of the kingdom. And once he was found, I imagine this man, this young man with an unpronounceable name hobbling in the throne room of the king, the most powerful king to ever live. And when he appeared before David, I'm sure he probably expected the worst. Come on, right? He expected at least if the king had mercy to be banished from the throne, to be banished from the king, to be banished from society, right? Oh no, I'm going to be killed because what well, I belonged to the household of Saul, right? Saul was my grandfather. But what did David say? He said, don't be afraid. Take heart, David said to him, for I will surely, I will show kindness for you for Jonathan, your father's sake, and I will restore your land and everything to you. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? You see, he expected to be greeted uh, with a reason to fear, but instead he was met with favor. Uh, I have a German Shepherd Lab and it never fails, okay, I promise. Um, in fact, in, in October for Jamie's birthday, I bought her a chocolate cake from Whole Foods. Beautiful chocolate cake, had the you know, uh, 29th birthday, all that stuff, candles, it's, all, it's great. Brought it home and uh, put it in the fridge and it was her birthday, we took it out. We did, to cut a slice for each of us, sat on the couch and had a slice of chocolate cake. And all of a sudden we heard a noise coming from the kitchen, okay? And it sounded like, you know, someone is eating at the dinner table and it's obnoxious, like they're just they're eating with their mouth open. And the noise was coming from the kitchen. It turns out it was Chad eating the chocolate cake. And so those of you who know who have a, a dog, you know that chocolate is not good for dogs. but. Chad's fine. I'm telling you, he's good, okay? Jamie was stressing out, worried about, oh my gosh, the, the dog, what are we going to do? We call the vet. And 
guess what? He's fine. He's good. He's absolutely good. In fact, when we're sitting down having lunch or dinner, or he's going to be you know, coming around us trying to get food, trying to get the crumbs that fall from our plate, okay? Um, in fact, he won't even wait for that. He'll jump up on us and he'll try to lick our mouths, right? Not to show affection, but to get food from us, right? That's what he does. And this is what Mephibosheth is saying. He's saying, I'm not worthy to, to, to eat from the crumbs that fall from your dinner table. Okay, what my father has done, what he's put you through, I don't deserve favor. I don't deserve the grace, the kindness that you've shown to me. And here is this man who's been unnoticed, unwanted, under-resourced, but realizing this generous invitation from the king, right, to be pulled up a seat at his table, this invitation, he realized that he was undeserving and it was unearned and that he could never repay it. It was unrepayable. Which brings us to our third and final reason why you and I are like Mephibosheth. He was given a seat at the royal table. You see, David said, you're not going to be executed. I brought you here. Come on. I, I didn't bring you here to execute you. I brought you here uh, to adopt you. And from now on, I decree at my table, okay, this is your seat, Mephibosheth. This right here, this is your seat. Let's put your name on it, okay? And I decree from now on, right? I'll sit here and, and, and my sons and my daughters will sit here. And Mephibosheth, this is your seat. Let's put your name on it. And of course, they had to help him get to his seat, right? Uh, um, you know, they didn't have ADA laws back then, and there wasn't, you know, ramps or elevators for him. And so maybe somebody, you know, had to hold him by the elbows and help him find him a seat. And somehow he manages to find his seat at the table. And his chair was pushed in, and his a napkin was placed upon his lap, and and, and he he got to dine and, and to wine with the king and the king's host and the king's friends and the king's family. And and, and there, and he, I'm sure he realized at some point he realized and he looked up and said oh, I have a place where I belong the, 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 there's people here that love me and, and want me to be here right there's a good king that's smiling at me and asking me uh, how my day was and, and, and who loved my dad and, and now he's showing kindness to me right and he, watch this, and he who lived in Lodabar, a place of no pasture, a place where even the animals did not have a, nothing to eat, a place so remote that even Luke Skywalker wouldn't even go to, okay? Look, uh, Last Jedi, I only watched, that's the only Star Wars movies I've ever watched, okay? I know it's sad, it's awful, I get it, okay? Don't send me an email, don't send me the movies, it's too late, okay? I'm past it, okay? And here he is, just... A place so remote, and now he who was in Lodabar is sitting at the king's table, getting to feast, dining, and being lavish with the finest of meals, being food being catered and specialized, made just for him, and filling his cup with wine, and his belly is full, and they're eating food and talking and having conversation, and when the food is being removed from the table, there's opportunity for coffee and pie to come around, and where they have conversation, and to share stories, and to, and to share inside jokes with one another, and laugh and cry until their belly hurts. Right here is this guy who was once in Lodabar and now has a seat at the king's table. This is Christmas. That's what Christmas is all about, right? Happening all around the table around good food, good company, rich relationships, real relationships, and rich life. That's Christmas, and that's what God wants you to have. To He's inviting you into with His people. And Christmas shows the extreme length to which God will go to get what he wants. What did it take for us to have a seat pulled up at the Christmas table? It took God sending his son to be born in a stable, living among animals, 
living a life where uh, he was doubted, mocked, ridiculed, right? Suffering on a cross among thieves, right? Where he died and resurrected from the grave three days later. Come on. And when he sent, he ascended into heaven and then he sent his spirit into the world. He sent his spirit to seek after you, to seek you, to find you in Lodabar, right? And to invite you at the king's table where you can dine and where you can wine and where you can be invited. Why? Not because he's mad at you, because he loves you, because he wants to bless you, because he wants you to prosper, because he has a plan for your life, because he wants you to be a son and a daughter of the king. Come on, where he has invited you into this relationship at this table to dine with him. That's Christmas. So, of course, right? He did this. Why? Not because you deserve it. He did this for Jesus' sake, right? He, he didn't do this. Of course you don't deserve it, right? He did this for Jesus' sake. Just like David did for Mephibosheth, God did for us, right? He did it for Jonathan's sake, and now God is doing it to us. He wants to bless you for Jesus' sake. What David did for Mephibosheth is what God did for us. He wants to adopt you into the family. He wants you to feast at the royal table. So come on, strike up the music, right? Pour the wine, serve the best of food. Come on, and let the party continue. But you know what's the best part, right? Remember, Mephibosheth realizes um, maybe somewhere through the, the second course and he's sitting there at the table and he realizes, wait a second. Uh, I felt like an outcast my entire life because of my lame legs, but no one can see them while I'm seated at the table. And when I'm at the table, I'm just like everyone else. I'm just like one of the king's sons. And I've been an enemy of the state since I was five, right? My life shattered right in front of my eyes and nothing has ever been the same. Now I'm sitting next to Absalom. Absalom. Absalom, who from the top of his head to the sole of his feet, there's never been a better looking man in the kingdom. Absalom, Absalom, with such long, beautiful hair, who probably uh, sat at the dinner table combing his hair with a fork like Ariel, right? Absalom, Absalom, who so vain that thought about the song sung about him. Absalom, I'm talking about Absalom, Absalom, can we take a picture? Can we take a selfie? Yeah, bro, let's take a picture, right? Oh, da King, freaking King David, da King David, David, tell us, tell us about what it was to kill Goliath. Look, what I'm trying to say to you today is this. And his condition was hidden by his position at the table. What I'm saying is that your history doesn't have to determine and define your, your future. Your history doesn't have to define your destination. But rather, I'm here to tell somebody that today could be your last day in Lodabar. Come on, Jesus wants you to sit at his table and dine with him. So open up. Are you willing to receive that invitation? All right? How do you get there? Two ways. Don't miss it. Two ways. Don't miss it. How do you get there? How do you pull up a seat at the king's table? Two ways. You ready? Be humble and sit down. Thank you, Kendrick. <laughs> Be humble and sit down. Right? In other words, take a card out of Mephibosheth's playbook, right? He said, who am I that I should show such kindness to me, right? Who, David, who am I that you should love me, that you should show favor and kindness to me, right? See, he didn't deserve it. Here's this man who was unnoticed, unwanted, and under-resourced, but realized, man, this is unearned, it's unrepayable, and I, I, this is far above what I deserve, David. Thank you, David. I don't deserve this. I am not worthy of your kindness. You see, be humble and sit down. What does that mean? Simply, just accept the invitation and sit down. This is, this is all just New Testament, you know, grace and doctrine that I'm just teaching you. Come on, this is simple, right? Right? Ephesians says this. It talks about, right, it's for you who were dead in your sins and trespasses. And it says, but God. We were dead in our sin, but God. We were dead in our sin, but God. 
We were dead in our sin, but God. See, the gospel isn't about bad people becoming good, but about dead people coming to life. And you see, Ephesians says, as for you, you were dead in your sins, but because of his great love, God, who is rich in his mercy, he made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by his grace we have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ, and watch this, and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You see, we have been placed into heavenly places, and now we get to be ambassadors. We get to be ambassadors of that kingdom, of those heavenly places, right? We get to be on the committee that go out to load the bar, right? And, re and recruit and to encourage and to bring hope and to spread the love of Jesus, to invite more Mephibosheths at the table where he can dine, where he can experience the love and the mercy and the grace of Jesus. That's Christmas. That's what the Christmas table is all about. Inviting people into the family of God. In fact, for the next several weeks, uh, you and I, we're going to have a conversation right here at this table of how you and I are going to get involved as a church financially and how we can make a difference in the foster care system. Here in Oakland and the East Bay, there's an organization called Foster the Bay for Christ. And next week, we're going to have a seat pulled up right here where we can talk about how we can financially give back to our city and to our community where children this Christmas will not have a table to call home for themselves. And how you and I can, come on, right, leverage what we have to invest into the Mephibosheths where they can have a seat pulled up at the table where they can become part of the family of God. Next week, don't miss next week, we're going to have uh, Foster the Bay at this table where we can talk and have a frank conversation of how we can financially give to Foster the Bay. And so I'm asking you as your pastor, for you, of those of you who call Storyline home, I'm asking you to pray about how much you can give towards this initiative to bless the least in our city and in our community for this Christmas. Invite a friend. Don't miss next week. Let me pray for us, God. We're so thankful that you have allowed us to have a seat pulled up at the table. The only reason we can is because of the grace and the love and the sacrifice of Jesus who opened up his life so that we can have a seat at the table. And so I pray for those maybe have never received that invitation. They would be humble and they would sit down and receive that free invitation to sit at the table. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if that's you, you've never received that invitation to follow Jesus. I want to encourage you in the chat, in the comment section, you're going to see a link there. It's our connection card. You're going to follow that link and where you can hit subscribe and you can follow Jesus. And there's a link there. You can do that. Come on. I want to encourage you to do that and make that decision to pull up a seat at the table and be humble and sit down and follow Jesus. Go ahead and follow that link. We love you. We cannot wait to see you next week. Don't miss next week as we have a conversation with Philip about fostering the bay for Christ. See you next week, Storyline.